Sheikh, we run solid. Sheikh, Bismillah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair for this uh, kind uh, introduction. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from each and every one of us. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the best in this dunya and in akhirah. And I can only start by saying bounty. Allah barik fiqh afiyata inshallah. The idea of uh, meeting these beautiful brothers and sisters and the idea of speaking with all of you from my kitchen, I wanted to make it personal because I believe that I'm speaking to my own brothers and sisters. I also believe, alhamdulillah ta'ala, that the brothers and the idea and the vision in putting Masjid al Mu'minin in Houston, Texas, it's a beautiful seed. It is the first Mu'minin community, the first Nigerian community, the first African community that I see that they did their time to ensure that the future Muslim generation in America is intact. I'm very sure that each and every member at Al Mu'minin community they have the ability to amass as much wealth as they can and to retire and go back to Nigeria and live luxuriously. I am very sure of that. I'm also very sure, mashallah, that the entire community in, in, the, in the Mu'mineen community in Houston, Texas, they have the ability to forget about the world. But because they are selfless, they dedicated time to ensure that our people also have a better chance similar to the one that we have here in America. But this is also the vision of a young man who put together the best investment in the world, Sanki Yedem. Sanki Yedem was the best investment there was. Sanki Yedem Jamia. Khairuddin Kajaji Afendi was a young man who every time he would go in front of a store or in front of a sweets place, he would look at a dish or he would look at a sandwich and he would say, Sanki Yadam. Sanki Yadam. It means I have already eaten. Ka'anni akalt, as they say in Arabic. Ka'anni akalt. Khalas. I have already eaten. And he would look at the price of that piece of sweets in Turkey, and he would look at the price of the sandwich, and he would take that price and put it in a box. Time lapse, by the time he's almost in his 60s, he breaks open the box, and whatever amount of money that he amassed, he would take it out and go purchase a land. Whenever he purchased that land, he surrounded the land with a small wall. And he called it Sanki Yadim Jamia. So he made that place as a masjid. Mind you, this was 270 years ago. This was 1750. And today, when you go to Al Fatih, only 200 people were able to pray in that musalla. It was a small masjid. When you go to Al Fatih city in Turkey, Istanbul, it's not only in the middle of town, you can almost not know that it's a masjid. But the name of the masjid is Sanki Yadim Jamia, as if I have already eaten. And so, subhanAllah, we put in a small seed and we make it grow. And by the time that it grows, whether we witness the big tree or not, it doesn't matter. But just imagine 200 people started to pray in that small musalla, Sanki Yadim Jamia, the masjid of I have already eaten by Khairuddin Kajaj Afendi. Imagine that 50, 60, 80, 100, 150, 200, 270 years later, you have people pray there and they have no idea who built this masjid. 
But every time someone prays in that masjid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is elevating their status in al-jannah. Every time someone prays in that masjid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is elevating their status in al-jannah. Every time someone makes sujood in that masjid, every time somebody makes salah, every time somebody goes in and make dua, every time somebody goes in and engages in a solace moment, every time someone goes in and donates, every time somebody goes in because they want to commit toba, repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every time someone goes in and make dua, sincere dua for either forgiveness or sincere dua for a better life, Khair al-Din Kajaj Effendi is, his status is being elevated higher and higher and higher. And so the idea is when we engage in such thing, when we make sure that this is the intention, then not only our intentions become pure, the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guaranteed. And also in this dunya, the project inshallah ta'ala is successful. I know the brothers in Houston know exactly what I am talking about when I speak about the following story. In 1963, a young man came to Houston, Texas from India of all places. And his aim was to finish his master's degree and go back to where he came from. At the University of Houston, he met another three or four brothers. Some of them were doing their PhD, some of them were finishing their undergrad, and some of them were doing their masters as well. And so one time when they met, they will tell one another, where can we pray in a congregation of prayers? It's okay to pray separately, but where can we pray in a congregation of prayers? They spoke to the university and they were given a small lecture hall. <laughs> And on Fridays, he says to me personally, he says, when I stand up after Juma and I ask people for donations, if they can give me between three to $7, we will rejoice. If we made it to $10, that day we would go and buy lunch or we will distribute the money in a way that we pay rent for another week to be prayed or congregational prayers at the university because they had to rent that place. In 1972, the Houston Chronicles writes an article that Muslim mass reaches 1,000 in the city of Houston. Mind you, this is 1972. In 2007, we had to remodel the main center, the masjid at the Islamic Society of Greater Houston. And I'm very sure the brothers in Houston, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Mayor White at the time sat by me and he says, Radwan, Mr. Saleh, how many Muslims are there in the city of Houston, do you know? I said, well, sir, I would think probably about 270, 280, I don't know. So he jokingly said, do you think I could say 268? Today, there is more than 400,000 Muslims in the city of Houston. 54, 55 years later. Today, there is more than 200 masajid in the city of Houston. And the young man who came to Houston in 1963 to study his masters, he, subhanAllah, is the father of Yasser al-Qadi, Dr. Yasser al-Qadi. And this is Dr. Mazhar Qadi, the father of the well-known scholar Yasser Qadi. Yasser Qadi was born in Houston, Texas. Yasser Qadi was so smart, mashallah, very intelligent young man. He did his master's in chemistry at Rice University, which would like to call Harvard of the South. And then he goes after memorizing the entire Quran in one year as a dedicated time to memorize the Quran in one year. He goes to Medina, he study, and he comes back to be a scholar of Islam from Yale University. So he has a doctorate degree from Yale University in Islamic studies and comparative religion. Today, he's a source to the Muslim community in the entire peninsula, in this entire continent called the United States. 
And you should see the way he speaks internationally. He was asked by many countries to come and speak. The reason is when someone plants a seed somewhere, if the end of days, the day of Yom Qiyamah, the day of resurrection starts, and in your hands there was a small plant, put it in the ground. It's not your job, it's not your business, whether it grows to be a big tree or not, it's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But do I have the intentions? Do I have the will? Do I have the ability to put even one dollar for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such an amazing auspicious project? And subhanAllah, when we build the masjid, we build a community. This has always been the testimony of time. Whenever we build a masjid, we build a community. There is no way that I have would have known the amazing brothers and sisters. And by the way, there is amazing sisters at Al Mu'minin. Sometimes I feel one sister is equal to a hundred men. The way they dedicate themselves to the community, the way they dedicate themselves to the deen, the way they dedicate themselves to the future Muslim generation of America, the way they dedicate themselves to give da'wah to Muslims and non-Muslims in that community. There is no way I would have known any of you if it was not for the masjid called Masjid al muminin Who built it? Maybe we would know who he is. But then who upkept it? Who put it together? Who put this momentum, this continuum for that community to continue to prosper? We all know who they are. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward them, the volunteers, those who dedicate their times, the imam of the masjid, Sheikh Abdul Rahman, may Allah bless him, and the entire community. So when we build a masjid, we actually build a community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran and he says, The first house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has ever been placed on the face of the earth, it was the one in Bakka or meaning Mecca. Al-Ka'ba sharrafa Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it a house because it houses people together to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he went to Medina, as people were grabbing the muzzle of his she camel, you stay with me, no, you stay with me. And they were fighting among themselves. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Qala da'uha fa'innaha musayyara. Leave it alone, it is guided by Allah. And wherever that she camel knelt, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't say, this is where I'm going to build my house. This is where I'm going to build my mansion. This is where I'm going to have the playroom. The third, the third room is going to be in this place, the master bedroom. He, none of that. <clears throat> but he said one thing. In this place, we will build the masjid, which is Masjid Quba. Whenever we go to Medina, <clears throat> we go and visit the masjid. <clears throat> Excuse me. We go and, and visit the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But we also, as he used to do every Saturday, he would walk, literally walk seven kilometers one way to Masjid Quba. He will pray there, as he said, anyone who aims to pray, who make wudu in their home and journey to Quba and prays two rak'ah, it's equivalent to a Umrah. So he would go there, he would pray and come back. That's 14 kilometers every week. <laughs> But that was the first masjid. And imagine today this rainbow of representation of this ummah, 2.3, 1.8, it doesn't matter. Billion Muslims on the face of the earth. And it started from the few. But Al-Abbas, when he saw Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam joining efforts with the community to build that masjid, Look at this man pointing at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Each and every one of us is carrying one block at a time. Except Muhammad sallallahu he's carrying two blocks at a time. He was hastening the moment to build that wall, to build that masjid, to surround the area 
so that Muslims can come and pray. And that is amazing. But why did he do that? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he knows the importance of having a masjid in any community. As Shafi'i used to say, if you don't have a scholar in a community or a good doctor, don't stay in that community. And so it behooves us. It becomes a responsibility on each and every one of us, man and woman, to ensure that this masjid is inshallah ta'ala built. It doesn't matter whether you pray there or not, and it doesn't matter whether it's in your community or not. But at least that community, we don't know who is the next scholar is gonna come out of. Maybe perhaps inshallah, the best reciter in the world will come out of that masjid. Here in Irving, Texas, we had an opportunity about 15 years ago to, uh, it's now 25 years ago, to purchase a land at a very cheap price because the land nobody cared about, it was closer to a highway. You should come and see where that land has become. It is the largest masjid in all Texas. And look it up, the, the Irving Masjid. Look how big it is. And it started from a house, by the way, small house. And today it is the largest masjid in Texas. It's surrounded by homes that if a home goes for sale, it's bought within a few hours. It's unheard of. And the reason is because once you build a masjid, you build a community. When we build this community, then inside this masjid, we have Eid prayers, we have Taraweeh prayers, we have funeral prayers, we have the Sunday school or the weekend school. In these masajid, we have the ability to educate people. A non-Muslim can come and take refuge in our masjid without any questions. Let him or her learn about the deen, see how Muslims interact with one another. Let them see how the young men and women are performing hifz al-Quran. Let them see men and women coming together, as the brother earlier said, in halaqat after Fajr, maybe after Maghrib, after Isha, and that would be our dedication to the future Muslim generation in America. The same way the Muslim future generation in the area where this masjid is going to be built. And subhanAllah, I was told that the brother who was leading the fundraising efforts for this masjid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him, inshaAllah ta'ala to Jannah. Yaqulun Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man bana fi hadith Usman ibn Affan, any one of us who engages in building a masjid or at least help in building a masjid or builds a masjid out of their money, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised that he will build for them a house in a jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يَعْمُرُ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ only those who are dedicated to the deen, true believers, who will upkeep these masajid. You can see, you can see from the pictures that are being played above that the masjid is being built and it only needs a small push to make it finished. And we all know that a dollar goes a long way in the places where we came from. Perhaps in America, it may cost a million, half a million, two, three million dollars to build a masjid, but not in these locales. So if we dedicate ourselves, and I'll be, inshallah ta'ala, one of those who will be donating today on behalf of my own parents. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate them in a jannah. May Allah elevate all of our parents who are either with us or pass to Allah to be elevated in a jannah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed, innama ya'muru masajid Allah. Indeed, innama ya'muru masajid Allah. Those who upkeep the masajid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly are the believers in Allah and in the hereafter. These are the, the, the first and the last pillars of faith in Islam. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul, qala iza ra'aytum ar-rajula yartad al-masajid, fashhadu lahu bil-iman. If you see a man or a woman frequent the masajid, witness to them that they are believers. So how can we have people frequent the masajid if the masjid is not built? 
just imagine if we have the ability to make this masjid comes to fruition and be finished, how many people will come here to pray? And the more people that come here to pray, and it doesn't have to be us, we are what, eight to 9,000 miles away. But as more people come to this masjid to pray, we gain the reward. Even if we gave a dollar, yes, even if we give a dollar. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put barakah in that dollar. And how so? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ayakul, qala, sabaka darhim mi'atu alf. One dollar is equal to 100,000. Qila kayfa ya Rasulullah? Qala rajunun lahu darhiman. One man has two dollars. Fa'anfaqa ahaduhum fi sabirillah. He took one dollar and he gave it fi sabirillah. وَأَمَّا الْآخَرْ فَلَهُ مَالٌ كَثِيرٌ The other man has a lot of money or the other sister has a lot of money. And she took a hundred thousand dollars and she gave it في سبيل الله. That will not put a dent in her income because mashallah she has a lot of money. But another brother who only has two dollars took one dollar and gave it في سبيل الله. So that means he gave half of his wealth في سبيل الله. So one dollar is equal to a hundred thousand dollars in rewards. And so we should not worry about whether I can only give a dollar. Maybe I can only make dua. Maybe I don't have much. And I just came because I was invited to come to this event. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also reminds us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has invited you to spend this as it is in Surah Muhammad. There you go, have been invited. How many of us <clears throat> got a chance or an invite in our emails or a text. And today is Saturday here in America, so a lot of us would like to sleep in, maybe take the family out, but you decided on this beautiful sunny day. It's sunny day for me here in Texas anyways. And I'm very sure in Texas, it's sunny almost everywhere when, it, when it's sunny, but then it's a big state. It could be sunny in one place and rainy in another and storming somewhere else. But at least here in Dallas, Texas, it's sunny. I didn't have to come to this event. But I came because there is a reason for me to be here. And the same thing to all of us. You didn't have to come, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ha antum ha fi You have been invited to spend fi sabilillah. Some of you will be stingy and miser and keeps back. But if you are miser and stingy, that's against your own self. Allah is ghani, Allah is rich. And I can guarantee you, inshallah ta'ala, whether we will witness it or not, this masjid will be built. Because once the seed has been planted in this locale, that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided for one of his houses to be built. Whether you and I be participants in it or not, that's a moot point. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided for this masjid to be built. So it's best for us to be part of it. And therefore, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We cannot make a special journey except to three masajid. Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, Al-Bayt Al-Haram, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, wa Masjid Iha. The Al-Ka'ba, the Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem, Sharrafah Allah, and the Masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so when we go to Umrah or Hajj, we visit these places. And if Allah enables us to go to Jerusalem to pray in Al-Aqsa, then we should do that. <laughs> However, if you ever go to Nigeria and you have the ability to come to this place, please make a special effort to go visit and get to see the project by yourself and take pictures and show them on social media. Be proud that we have a masjid in this locale and we have been showing it to the world. For us to donate, brothers and sisters, sometimes the shaitan will come and whisper to us. At the end of the day, if I have $10 and I took $1 and gave it for or let's say I took 10% of whatever I have amassed for Ramadan or others and gave it for Sabirillah, Allah is more generous than you and I. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man hasanan Who will give Allah alone? And when Allah gives back this loan to us, Allah is more generous than you and I. He doesn't give back a dollar 
or five dollars that we gave, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give multiplied in thousands, 700,000s worth. As the ayah has just been recited by our Qari a minute ago. But I have a question for all of us. What if, may Allah forbid, a doctor calls me and he says, Radwan, we looked at your diagnosis and you only have six months to live. I wonder what comes to be the most important thing in my life then. But then what if he calls and he says, you only have three months to live. We looked at your diagnosis. We looked at your medical history. And we see that by whatever education that Allah has given us, <laughs> that someone in your condition only has three months to live. So what becomes the most important thing in my life then? What if he said, you only have two weeks to live? Put your life affairs in order. Money is not that important anymore, is it? Taking vacation or planning for a vacation is not the most important thing in my life then. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to look at the next new car and want to buy it, nor am I going to look for the bigger house that I want to buy it. I'm not trying to be morbid. But my point is, money is not the most important thing. Money comes and goes. When we were born, we didn't know whether we will be wealthy or not. When we came to America, some of us, we did not know whether we will make it until today or not. When we came to this country, some of us had to loan things away in order to buy the plane ticket. But today we look at our homes, how big they may be. And the spring is knocking on the doors and we look at our garages and we say, when, when did we amass all of this? So money comes and goes. But if we invest right, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more generous than all of us. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give and he gives without limits. And so, we should spend before we go. We don't know when. I mean, if the doctor says you have six months, I'm a lucky man. Because he can tell me that I have six months, so now I have to prepare. And if he tells me, even if I have two days to live, at least <laughs> for these two days, I'm going to sit and do nothing except read Quran and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me. But you and I cannot guarantee that. None of us can guarantee that. And so we can go any moment. The brother who was dedicated to get this masjid off the ground, is no longer with us. So just imagine that he is no longer with us and he died. Allah says, spend from what I have given you to begin with. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That we spend from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already given us. And he says to us, give from what I have given you. As I said earlier, it doesn't have to be too much. It could be any amount out of your salah. And he says, Allah knows us. When he created us, he knows us. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, give from what I have given you, O man, O woman, O Muslim, because I know when death comes to us, he will be remorseful. And this is what you are going to say. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, just take me back. Just one second. Not to go beautify my business plan. No. Not to purchase that house that was waiting for me. No. Not to start a new business. No. Just so that I can give in salah. Just imagine that. Imagine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created you and I, he tells us, if you spend from what I have given you, or if you don't spend from what I have given you, I know by the time you come to your deathbed, 
you are going to say to me, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, just delay me, just one second, just, just one second. I am going to press that button and I will say, oh, spend 5,000 here, spend 1,000 there, spend 3,000. Oh, just give that $1 that I promised, that I pledged. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And Allah will never delay a soul that its time has come, even as a blink of an eye or a split of a second. His call is final. And when he calls us to him, we cannot go back. So to the brother or to the sister who is afraid of poverty, rejoice and be comfortable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised that our rizq is guaranteed. Al-Asma'i, a well-known scholar in Al-Kufa, he was in the masjid teaching the students and he was explaining to them, making tafsir in one of the ayat, as he says, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and he was reciting the ayah, وَفِي السَّمَاءِ رِسْقُكُمْ وَمَا تُعَلِمْ Your rizq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to all of us, وَفِي السَّمَاءِ رِسْقُكُمْ All of you. He didn't say to you, Muhammad, or Ahmed, or Zainab, or Uthman, or Khadija. No, he said to you, all of you. I have your rizq before you were born. In fact, 50,000 years before Allah told this world be and it was, our rizq is known, but it is hidden from us. So someone should not go and say, well, if Allah has my rizq, I should be just lazy, sit at home and not do anything. And I know my rizq will come to me. No, Allah has hidden that from us. But he said, meaning I have riz your rizq in a sama, meaning it's in ilm al -ghayb. You will never know whether you're going to get that business deal, whether you're going to get that certification or not, but you have to go out and work for it. So as he was explaining this, he continued with the ayah where it says, And there was a Bedouin listening. So after the dars, after the halaqa finished, he walked up to Al-Asma'i, this well-known scholar. He said, Qala, man ant? Who are you? He says, Al-Asma'i. You know, Bedouins sometimes, they're just harsh in the way they deal with one another. So he said, who are you? He didn't even ask him, what is your name, sir? And mashallah, I, I saw you recite and explain. But who said, who are you? He said, Al-Asma'i. And of course, the alim was a yani, humble man. He didn't say, don't you know who I am? He just says, Al-Asma'i. I'm Al-Asma'i. He said, can you recite the ayah for me again? And Al-Asma'i, Jazallah khair, the scholar, he recited the ayah once again. And of course, the Arab, this was their language. So he said, Man lana? Who angered Allah that compelled Allah to swear to us that our rizq is in his hands? So even the scholar was perplexed. And he was shocked and he said, what are you talking about? He said, didn't you say that Allah says, السماء, he swears by heavens and earth that he has our rizq? Who angered him? We believe. When Allah says, السماء, He says, we believe. Of course we do. Of course we know that our rizq is in the hands of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why would Allah swear? This is to tell us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guaranteeing for all of us that the rizq truly in his hands. And that no one has control over your rizq. Your manager may only sign your check, but that job was meant for you. Your business was supposed to prosper. It's just the store and the building happen to be there so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you that guarantee of that rizq. So we should not be afraid. And therefore, we should spend fi sabirillah when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam قَالَ قُلْ إِنَّ رَبِّ يَبْسُطُ الرِّزْقَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is telling Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to tell all of us through this ayah قُلْ إِنَّ رَبِّ يَبْسُطُ الرِّزْقَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ وَيَقْدِرُ لَهُ Allah gives and guarantees the plentifulness of this provision for all of us. And then he 
takes away according to his wisdom to whomever he wills. So whether you're a taxi driver or whether you're a doctor, which there is a huge difference between the two. This is the rizq that Allah has guaranteed for you. And each one of us was created so that he or she would work with that rizq. This is not to say as a friend of mine who was a taxi driver here in Dallas, Texas, he used to stand in line. But while he was standing in line, he was reading books. Today, he's one of the most successful accountants in all Dallas. He has clients that go from taxi drivers all the way to business owners, and his income is in the millions. So who to say that our rizq increases and decreases according to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the end of the day, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this hadith Qudsi, he tells us, and this is the culmination, the summary of all this talk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every morning he sends an angel that stands at the horizon. And he says, Yabna Adam, innaka in tabdhulil fadl khaynul lak. If you spend from what Allah has given you, it's good for you. Wa in tamsukhu sharrun lak, but if you hold back, it's again, it's yourself. Wa la tulam ala kafaf, and you will not be blamed by making it simple on your life. Meaning, stay with kafaf. If you can give a dollar, give. If you can give a thousand, give. If you can give five thousand, if you can give fifty thousand dollars, give. Because Allah subhanahu wa taala, كما في الصحيحين عن أبي هريرة قال قال الله تعالى أنفق يا ابن آدم أنفق عليك. This is Hadith Qudsi, another one from Al Bukhari and Muslim. عن أبي هريرة أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم says, O son of Adam, meaning also O daughter of Adam, spend, I will spend on you. Just imagine if Bill Gates come and knock on one of our doors. And we all know who Bill Gates is. Okay, maybe today I can say Jeff Bezos, the richest man on the face of the earth. It used to be Bill Gates and now Jeff Bezos. And he comes and knock on your door and he says, Ahmed, Uthman, Zainab, Khadija, Radwan, I have heard about your business idea. Go for it. I got your back. Would we worry? I don't think we would worry. And the reason that we would not worry is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ If we rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the true reliance, Allah is enough for us. So when we give, we should not be afraid because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace it for us. وفي حديث عمر بن الخطاب أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول لو أنكم توكلتم على الله حق توكله لأكلتم كما تأكل الطير تغدو خماصا وتروح بطانا النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم says just like all of us even if you were the wealthiest of all you go to your business in the morning and we don't know whether it's going to be in the red or in black that day based on the stock market, based on the business world, it doesn't matter. Maybe there is a disaster somewhere. Similar to a taxi driver, similar to a doctor. We leave home, we don't know whether we're gonna catch more clients that day or whether we are going to come back empty-handed. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, if you rely on Allah, the true reliance, you will leave like the bird that has no GPS. It doesn't know where it's going to get that seed or that worm from. It leaves empty stomach. But it comes back filled in its stomach. And in one of these documentaries, I saw a bird that was followed by one of these documentary filmmakers that it flew out of the nest. But when it came back, it had more food in its stomach and extra in its throat. And you can see the baby birds dip their peak inside their mom's mouth and eat. So that means not only the bird came back filled in its stomach, but the bird came back with extra to feed its young. And that's relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when we rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ensure ourselves that we do the due diligence to go out and earn, but then some of that earning has to also benefit those who are around us from the zakah and in projects like these from the sadaqah. 
And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaks directly to merchants, to those who happen to be with extra wealth. If you and I are not merchants, probably our income is going to be from employment. But the people who own small businesses or bigger businesses such as merchants, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has given them. So the reliance on Allah becomes even more important. And the income inshallah ta'ala will be blessed and it will be extra. And so and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Qala ya ma'ashara tijjar to the community of merchants. Oh, to the community of merchants. Inna hadha al-bay'i yahburuhu allahu wal half ala fashubuhu bisaraqa. I know there was maybe some noise. Uh, and so, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to the community of the merchants, he says to them, Ya ma'ashara tujjar, O community of merchants, in the al bay'a, this selling and buying, this trade of yours, yahduruhu al-half wal Sometimes you say, Wallahi, this is only $3. I bought it for $3 and you could have bought it for three cents because you want to buy it, at a, you want to sell it at a higher rate. But you've made a mistake. You have so many items. So unintentionally, you lie. And the V Salah says, That will happen. And so to avoid being a liar, give Fisabirillah Sadaqa. Fashubuhu, it means cleanse your dealings wrongfully, unintentionally, by giving. In salakat. I don't want to take too long. And I know sometimes when you sit and you listen to someone, it becomes boring. I know that. But let me adorn some story and then perhaps we come to an end because we don't want to take too much of your time either. Ibn Kathir gives an amazing story and he writes about Ibn Abi Hatim. Ibn Abi Hatim was a well-known scholar who traveled to Azerbaijan, a Far East Muslim state at the time. When he got there in a masjid that was being just built, but it became old and the community leader, the Imam of the Masjid, he said, yeah, Imam, we would love to ask you a favor that maybe tonight after Isha, there will be merchants coming to visit. And as you can see, the Masjid is getting older. The roof is not necessarily com uh, it's complete. But as you know, in this region, it gets very cold and it rains cold rain. And sometimes it comes in the Masjid. And so we need to beef up the walls and beef up the ceiling and the roof and to ensure that it is warm, but we don't have funds. So he said, khair, inshallah. So after Isha, the Imam, Abi Hatim, he stands up and he makes a pitch similar to what we are doing today. But subhanAllah, he mentioned the hadith of Rasulullah and Uthman ibn Affan, anahu qal, man bana lillahi masjidan kamifhasi qita, bana Allahu lahu bihi baytan fil jannah. If any one of us builds a masjid or help in building a masjid, even as, as small as a bird's nest. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Allah will build for him or build for her a house in Al-Jannah. And so and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, and especially Mathas Qita, meaning a, a bird's nest that is not built on the trees, but it's built on the ground. And he says, if we build a masjid as big as a bird's nest, where you can only fit one person in it, Allah will build for us a house or a masjid in Al-Jannah. And so one of the wealthy merchants stood up and he says, Qala, he says, Sheikh, Imam, he said, yes. He says, Allah, you promise? He was perplexed and he said, what do you mean? He said, do you swear to me that if I donate fi sabirillah, I will get a house in Al-Jannah? He said, of course, but then since he's a businessman and is a smart one as well, he said, well, here's a suck. Here is a suck in Arabic means he's a contract. Should I have a contract with you that if I donate, I will get a house in Al-Jannah? So he said, this is an authentic hadith of Rasulullah. He does not speak of his whims and desires. 
How can I guarantee something like this? It's already a hadith of Rasulullah. He says, fine, but I still need a guarantee. Would you write me this paper? <laughs> he said, sure, come. I believe wholeheartedly in what Rasulullah says. And for me to sign, it doesn't bother me much. So bring the contract. So he brings a contract and he says, Hada min Ibn Abi Hatim, this is from Ibn Abi Hatim, guarantees based on the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that anyone who builds or help building a masjid, Allah will build for them a palace in Al-Jannah. And he signs it and he gives it to him. After Isha, people left and people donated. Ibn Abi Hatim sleeps that night, subhanAllah. And he sees Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his dream. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looks at him and he says, Ya Abi Hatim, laqad rabi halbayat. The promise has been fulfilled. The promise has been fulfilled. Wala ta'ud. And never do this again. Subhanallah. Yani, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam guarantees for us that we will have a palace in Al-Jannah if we help in building one for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya. And that's what it is. We're building a house for Allah where the righteous amongst us, the sinful amongst us, those who seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amongst us come to the masjid. وفي حديث البراء النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول قال المسجد بيت كل تقي The masjid is the house of every righteous man and woman. So he said righteous nakira, meaning man or woman. ومن كان المسجد بيته and if any one of us seeks to make the masjid clean, pure, and it's as if it's our house, وَمَنْ كَانَ الْمَسْجِدُ بَيْتَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guarantee for us الْجَوَازِ عَلَى الصِّرَاطِ وَالْدَلَجَ إِلَى جَنَّةِ الرَّحْمَةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guarantee for us an easy path between heavens and hellfire into Al-Jannah because remember, the bridge to enter Al-Jannah is very thin. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it as wide as the eye could see for those who have been pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya. I don't want to take too long, but I will conclude by the benefits of giving in Sadaqah and especially for such auspicious project. Why do we give in Sadaqah? Take the following benefits, and that, inshallah ta'ala, will be the conclusion. There were many authenticated benefits about sadaqa that have been narrated about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah, and Nabiul Kareem. One of them, tutfi'ul khati'a kama yutfi'ul ma'un nar. It will extinguish our sins like water extinguishes fire from lit wood. And it will shut off or shields us from 70 or so harms that may come our way. We don't know what they are. Subhanallah, as-sadaqa taqi masara as-su, kama qalna msa'a sallam. Giving in sadaqa, it shields us from harm's way. We don't know when harm will come for us, but this we give forward so that it shields us almost like an insurance that we pay every month just in case a car hits us or we hit another car there is insurance it's the law of the land here in america but we pay in a pool where if such thing happens i am not burdened by thousands of dollars to pay someone's hurt or my hurt guaranteed us that al-bala, harm, or calamity, will not supersede a sadaqah. Meaning, the more we give sadaqah, the more harm takes steps back. وَإِنَّهَا تَزِيدُ فِي الْعُمُرِ Only the age and this life is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if we want to have longevity and righteous deeds with, with healthy life, then giving sadaqah it increases our longevity on this dunya. 
الصدقه extinguishes the wrath of Allah سبحانه وتعالى وكما كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم انها حجاب من النار لمن احتسبها and it will shield us from jahannam if we continue to give in sadaqat and finally which is subhanallah in today's hurtful world especially with this pandemic may allah shield us from it and may allah protect those who have been sick and give them cure and nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم قال داو مرضاكم بالصدقات داو مرضاكم بالصدقات give cure to your sick by giving in sadaqa on their behalf if you have a father or a mother that is alive and sick give sadaqa on their behalf if they pass may allah give them jannah give sadaqa on their behalf qala an-nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam idha mata ibn adam in qata'a 'amaluhu illa min thalath sadaqatun jariya aw ilmun yantafa'u bihi ba'da mawtih aw ibnun salihun yad'u lahu he continue with charity after death such as this knowledge that you left behind such as this because the imam will be teaching at this masjid or a righteous son because the children who are brought in the masajid their identity or their islamic identity is intact and they will make dua for you and so if they passed give sadaqa on their behalf even grandparents even our children make sadaqa intentions on behalf of our children لان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال داو مرضاكم بالصدقات give in sadaqa to cure the sick in your family jazakum allah khair may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from each and every one of us for those who are with us and wallahi i did not look recently after the beginning of the meeting today or this event as in how many participated with us and honestly i don't care because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ha antum haula'i tud'u only the few have been invited we invited so many people but the chosen few have attended today and guess what it's the quality not the quantity and i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whomever attended with us will be generous give a thousand give 5000 give 100000 give a million give as much as you can so that this project inshallah ta'ala who knows maybe by middle of ramadan or end of ramadan they can pray eid or maybe the last 10 days it doesn't matter but inshallah ta'ala next ramadan inshallah let's guarantee amongst ourselves and i will be the first one to donate inshallah that this coming ramadan the, the next ramadan we will get to inshallah ta'ala pray there and if allah enables me the pleasure and the honor to one day give khutbah in this masjid i will inshallah ta'ala be honored so i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from each and every one of us and i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put in our hearts to be extremely generous towards this campaign i will ask the moderators to please put a um, a banner on the screen as probably it has been seen you can point your cell phone on it and donate directly or i think we should put it on the Uh, chat the link and the contacts as in where to go and donate and if there is a website we should do that and if there is a direct um, donation we should do that and i'm pretty sure the donation would be given here and then if you can claim your taxes i don't know all the details but inshallah ta'ala you can but nonetheless we should worry about making sure that this masjid is built and comes to fruition so that musallin can sit inside and make dua for all of us wallahi they may not know us and they probably will never get to meet us personally but the dua that they will make for us it will last forever so with that jazakum allah khair wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin jazakum allah khair wa iyakum wa iyakum amin amin amin